okay good evening everyone so uh, in the series of our lecture series of our various research topic in palliative medicine i think today uh, we are very very fortunate that dr fiona robinson is with us uh, i think most of the people in this country they know fiona very well a uh, very good friend of uh, indian palliative care community very good friend of youngsters those who wants to pursue higher and who wants to learn more about uh, palliative care and she is also very favorite teacher of many of the students those who have done uh, uh, diploma and uh, msc palliative medicine from cardiff university uh, and uh, um, at personal level i can say that fiona is a very good friend of uh, mine and for all the faculty members of the this country whenever we meet we meet like a, uh, and we are eagerly waiting to see her on the bangalore conference uh, just for the new uh, new resident and no new dnb students those who have joined recently palliative medicine you know now there are uh, at least uh, in 15 places there is post graduate program is going on where various they are doing uh, md palliative medicine and dnb palliative medicine so now there are many students those who are joining these classes uh so uh, i for them i think i really want to introduce formally to dr fiona fiona dr fiona is professor and post graduate course director post graduate palliative medicine care cardiff university school of medicine cardiff she is also senior fellow of higher education academy she is an external examiner of glasgow university she is adjunct faculty members of kmc manipal with navin she is consultant in palliative medicine for city hospice cardiff uh, uh her, if we consider her award and uh, uh, honors i think there are many many awards she has received including winner of medic star award 2021 for inspirational leadership and teaching center of medical education nomination for teachers award for outstanding clinical and academic commitment during pandemic oh good this so i was not knowing so now i'm so happy to see this award 2021 and there is uh, sfhea april 2021 uh, award and there her area of interest is r developing the palliative and end of life care skills of health and social care workforce communication team working mentoring and leadership using technology to enhance delivery of education and delivering education that will make a difference to patient care So with this introduction, I am so happy and proud that Dr. Fiona is with us, and she is going to teach us something very, very different. Uh, different topic, I mean, like a very important topic. I think it's not different and not difficult. But if you will learn from Fiona, it will become very, very easy. So, Dr. Fiona, please go ahead and thank you very much for accepting our invitation. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for a very gracious introduction which always leaves me feeling sort of slightly i don't really think that's me but it's a real honor and privilege to be asked to join you this evening so thank you it's a bit of an action packed hour i think that's probably what i need to say first so during this hour there are going to be a couple of polls which ask you to um to give an answer and i'll use the chat function quite a lot just so that there may be moments where just post a word post a phrase in the chat and just get that feeling as if we were all in the room together we are really excited to be all being well coming to bangalore in february and we have just done our own first face to face teaching last week and tomorrow for the cardiff course and it's wonderful zoom connects us being face to face and chatting is also important so when we ask when i ask you to use the chat function please don't be shy please write something in the chat and that will just help the group to feel together so all being well i hope i'm going to be able to share my screen and what i need to just check is with Oh, can I you're in my sights is my screen sharing all right um, we can see it but not yet on the full screen slide yes now we can now we, we can, can. your 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 world is going for your eyes there we are i'm on my front i think i think i'm on my front slide my front page yes wonderful Thank you. okay that's fantastic and i'm just going to put my timer on just so it keeps me to time 
It has been a sombre day in the UK today. Um, it is just after two o'clock in the afternoon and we have been, it has been a, an unexpected holiday because Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II died, as I'm sure you all know, 10 days ago. Um, and it's been a very fitting tribute to her and all sorts of interesting comments and reflections on death and dying and grieving and families. So I think it's quite an interesting time for palliative care. Anyway, we are here for the next just under an hour to talk about research design with a particular focus on quantitative methods, the numbers, the counting things, qualitative methods, the exploring studies and mixed methods research. I will make passing comment on systematic reviews, but I'm not going to cover systematic reviews um, during this next time, because I'm sure that you have um, separate, separate sessions on that, or if not, I think they deserve a, a separate session. And so what we're going to do is to look at the diff look at these different research paradigms, but particularly, I think, consider their application to palliative care. Um, so what I'd love to do, first of all, is to just check what's the knowledge about research in the meeting. So, Arkana, can we do questions one and two on the poll? So do you want to just... Um, Again, please, no answer should, no answer is worth keeping hold of. Please just give us your answers. How would you rate your knowledge and awareness of research methodology in palliative care? So just have a think. Partly because if there's a lot of greats in the room, then I'm really stuck just because I'm a very down to earth kind of person and I quite like just making things meaningful for us all as clinicians. We are all practicing clinicians, aren't we? That's lovely. Okay, thank you. That's great. Thank you. That's wonderful. So moderate, some limited and a few people none. That's fantastic. Sorry, I'm, my slides are definitely moving of their own accord. Um, and then the second question, have you been involved in research so far in your career? That's the second question. Lovely. OK, I think we can probably stop sharing and look at the results now. So sharing results there. So moderate sum, limited none. And oh, amazing. OK, 88% of you said yes and 13% no. That's really exciting. Thank you. That's wonderful. OK. And what's really useful, though, is that at the point that we've got questions about different search designs, then do please, as I say, feel free to add your add your comments to the chat. Right. Now, I'll just remind the that's lovely. OK, so here we go. Use the chat function. What is research? Have you got a phrase? Have you got a word that what does research mean to you? What does the word research or what does the term research mean to you? Put, a, put something in the chat. Finding, lovely word, finding, search again, exploring. I think finding is a very good word. I hadn't come across that word before. Inquisitiveness, that's a lovely one too. Finding answers explore, investigate, compare, gathering information, something new. Mamta, that's right, it's the new bit. Curiosity, that's a good word as well. Seeking, lovely. Okay, adding evidence. Ah, that's a really, that's a really good one. Finding new concepts, applying new notions, learning from new ideas. Thank you. Those are all absolutely fundamental. Ah, oh, that's a very good one. Challenging the dogmas. That's a fascinating way of thinking about it. And you're absolutely right. It, it's making sure that things that we have been doing in a certain way have got evidence behind them. We're bringing evidence into it, isn't it? But that scientific rigour, whatever the methodology, is really important. So hold your thoughts. We'll come back to the chat in a moment. Thank you. So what actually is research. The key thing is it's generating new knowledge. You're finding out something new. It's a detailed study of a subject, especially in order to gain new information or reach a new understanding. 
So you, I'm sure, may have come across quality improvement and audit, but they are not research. They are comparing practice against a standard. It's not new understanding. The need for evidence-based care is, is continuing. It's, it's absolutely vital that we develop our palliative care services on the basis of fact, on the basis of evidence. And it's estimated that globally only 14% of patients who need palliative care receive it. So we have to strengthen our palliative care services. Great, okay. Um, so next bit of chat is, what do you think the priorities for research are, either in your practice of palliative care or in, in the context of palliative care in India? What do you think the priorities for research are? What would you like to see as the priorities of research, potentially? And Taryn, thank you. I like that approving or disproving ideas. So what do you think the priorities for research are in your practice or in India? Is there a topic that you feel strongly about that you don't know very much about? Is there something of big need in your in your clinical world? I think the interplay of research and, and researchers and clinicians is fascinating because we need both. We clinicians need researchers, but researchers need clinicians as well to put that context of their self in. All oh, right, here we go. Lots coming up. Here we are. Um, alternative options to morphine that aren't expensive. Managing complex symptoms. Caregiving on caregivers. Yes. Improving quality of life. Yes. Concerns of paediatric patients and their caregivers and parents. Definitely. Attitudes. Yes. There's such a lot of difficult things around attitudes to death and dying and palliative care, aren't there? Spirituality, that's a really interesting one to try to research. We'll come back to spirituality. Evidence-based practice, yes. How do I know that giving, um, if I've got it available to me, an anticholinergic, how do I know for sure that it's going to help that rattle, big death rattle? Because sometimes it doesn't. Oh, Edita, this is lovely. Communication patterns between doctors and caregivers. Yes, personal acceptance. Acceptance is, is an essential component of the syllabus from a physiotherapist. Yes. So adjusting. How do we, what do we know about how people adjust? Lovely. Pain, anomal, palliative care, diseases, awareness. Wonderful. Art-based therapies. Wonderful. Communication at the end of life. Collusion. Lovely, thank you. Again, keep your ideas rolling, but it's useful just to have a feeling of actually where, where do you want research to go? And actually, if that's a topic that's of great interest to you, how can you gather up information about what is already happening? A lot is already happening. Um, so there was a very a fairly comprehensive systematic review published in 2020. And the, this is an international, this is an international review. So they, they trawled in their systematic review, international peer review journals of around palliative care. And these were the priority areas identified globally now. So service models, what's the best way, what's the best way to deliver palliative care, either as a specialist service or as part of your own service as an intensive or a geriatrician or a respiratory physician or a physiotherapist. Continuity of care. Our teams are under-resourced and at the moment under a lot of stress, so how can we ensure continuity of care? Training and education, one of my favourites. Inequality, that's a really important one. Communication, have you said, living well and independently. So a priority for palliative care research is not necessarily around dying, it's around living. Actually, palliative care, a lot of palliative care is about living, isn't it? It's about living until that last breath is taken. So living well and independently, recognising family and care and needs and the importance of families. So lots of the things that you were saying, in fact, have been reflected. And why this is important and this sort of study, systematic review is important, is that if you want to develop your research, area of focus where you are, it's useful to know sort of globally what 
the general feeling for research priorities are and it may be that that will help to secure you resources staff funding money if you're looking at research on a big scale but i'm going to bring us down to back down to earth now and just think a little bit about the hierarchy of evidence and one more chat what do you think is the most accurate the least chance of bias form of research design what do what are your what are your thoughts on that hierarchy of evidence is sounds easy it isn't quite randomized controlled trials yes rct yes 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 there's a special source of randomized controlled trial isn't there there's a double blind crossover yes and thank you yes actually it may be systematic reviews with meta-analysis so bringing huge pools of data together so you're absolutely right randomized controlled trials were the top of the tree i think probably just now pipped to the post by systematic reviews with with meta-analysis why this is important is just thinking of where your research design will fit in and being able to defend your research design because of course in palliative care with palliative care patients near the end of life conducting randomized controlled trials double blind crossover is extremely challenging if not impossible and so how are we going to in palliative care generate our robust evidence that's where this talk is so important so we've got systematic reviews at the top randomized controls other clinical trials with controls observational studies more and more biased case studies anecdote bench bench studies expert opinion down at the bottom with huge risk of bias but think about our topics in palliative care think about spirituality think about exploring views the huge importance of a robust qualitative design exploring people's thoughts and ideas that surely is a better tool for that sort of research question than randomizing controlling and double blinding so i'm just urging a slight caution note a caution for the hierarchy of evidence it's terribly important we need to know which studies are the least chance of bias which studies can we can we trust which studies are going to show us what we need them to show however palliative care as a discipline is a little bit different so the key is in understanding the robustness of these research methodologies so now at about 20 past we're finally getting to the absolute core of this talk but just one other word of caution here is that if there if you're going to explore quantitative methods and we're going to come on to those in a moment it's quite tempting to to devise your own tool devise your own measure because things aren't quite going to measure what you want them to measure with the scales that are already in, in existence the trouble with that is that if you devise a new measure then it's not going to have the same accuracy if you publish it and if it's then incorporated into a systematic review so there are now a number of validated tools around and a number of validated tools have been translated into Indian languages and are available to use. So my thoughts are if you're setting up a quantitative research method where you're counting things, you're, you're looking at numbers, scales, difference in numbers after an intervention. If you can use a tool that's validated and that others have used because then your data can be incorporated into somebody else's systematic review perhaps and then we've got more meaningful data particularly around some of the palliative care issues for India and for the Indian population so you need the most appropriate tool for the job so using a big hammer to mend my earring I think is not quite the right tool for the job so we've got another poll here now and this is just a flavour and we're going to come back and spend a little bit of time on each of these um, each of these things in about 10 minutes time but I'm just asking you how you would investigate 
how would you investigate the efficacy of a new analgesic for neuropathic pain? And please don't be shy. I can see there are 80 people on the call. Have a go. Nobody knows it's you. It doesn't matter if you're wrong. How would you investigate the efficacy of a new analgesic for neuropathic pain? Have a thought. Oh, I can, I can, I can hear people are thinking. I can hear people are thinking. And not sure is also a completely validated, a completely valid answer. That's fab. So keep going. And there are other. There are other questions. Lovely. Okay, the next one, views in your organisation about the impact of new legislation around end of life care. Number three is the impact of a new non-pharmacological approach for breathlessness. Number four, views of bereaved relatives on the impact of PPE, personal protective equipment on communication skills. There are some really exciting studies coming out now being published around some of the impact on management that we had had to endure during the peaks of COVID. So it's really worth keeping an eye out for those which may help us in whenever the next waves come along. Two novel agents for nausea and vomiting. Great. Views of healthcare professionals on the role of spiritual care education in the curriculum. Great. And barriers to patients achieving their preferred place of care. Great. OK, that's lovely. Have we got the results just very quickly? I think we've got we've got. Lovely. So the efficacy of a new analgesia for neuropathic pain, quantitative, qualitative and mixed. Yep. More quantitative than qualitative, I think. Views in your organisation around the impact of new legislation on end of life care. Mm, qualitative and mixed more than quantitative. New non-pharmacological non approach of breathlessness. Uh, yep, qualitative and mixed. Some mainly quantitative. Bereaved relatives PPE. Qualitative definitely seems to win the day on that one. Two different novel agents, nausea vomiting, more of a quantitative feel, great stuff. Health professional roles on spiritual care, the views of healthcare professionals, sorry, is more qualitative. And again, much more qualitative on that one. And then barriers to patients approving their preferred place of care. Great. OK, thank you. That's really helpful. As I say, keep keep your keep your thoughts on that because we will come back to it. But I think it's helpful just to. Just to begin to think about that, what's the right tool for this for this research question that I've got? Actually, actually, what do I want to know? Because it might be for a research topic. Actually, there may be two or three different ways that you could do things. And it may be affected by your time, your resources. It may not be perfect. Research is rarely perfect, but you may be able to derive a lot of meaning with a very simple project. So yes, you need the most appropriate tool for the job. So the first thing you do to think about your methodology actually needs to be to think about the question and to think about what is it that I want to find out? Is it an impact? Is it exploring? Do I need both numbers about how much people rate things? How much do people want spirituality in a curriculum? As opposed to actually, what do people think about it? Do they think it's a good idea? What other views have they got? So think about your quest, think about your topic, think about your question. First thing to do is to look out there to see actually what have other people done? And has anybody done that here in my country, in my setting? Have people done it in different countries, but in equivalent settings? So studies done in the middle of urban New York may not be extrapolatable to rural India. 
some studies might be the views on death and dying in a particular um, a particular community possibly, but really critically look at those papers. Just because they're published in a peer review journal doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to be applicable to you in the population that you are serving. So what's already known? Where are the gaps? Actually, has some people done what I want to do, but I still want to research this topic. I still want to do something about communication in end of life care. So what does the research tell me so far about evidence? And what new question? Remember, research is new. What new area do I want to explore? I'm sure you probably have separate um, sessions on actually designing and refining your question, but a classic example would be the PICO or the SPICE approach and refine it and refine it and refine it. So for the PICO, there are also um, slight variations on that with a particular S as a particular study design. So if you wanted to look at, particularly at a cohort study, for example, you would add a PICO S because in your, in your research question, you would add that cohort study and in your literature search, you'd look for cohort studies or exploring it a little bit more with SPICE, which has got more of the perspective, the setting, the context, which gives a little bit more background to your, your, um, your topic of interest. So for an example, PICO example would be, is there an impact of palliative care interventions on improving quality of life and satisfaction of older adults under end of life care? And that distills down to the P is the patients under palliative care, the I is the different palliative treatments, the C is the usual care practices, and the O, the outcomes of quality of life, satisfaction from care, identifying wishes of the patient. These are the sort of things though that will take time to explore and to write down and to think about. So research is really exciting and you're going to be finding out something new and contributing something back to the research community, to the clinical community, to the palliative care community. Patients and their families, children and their families will have a better quality of care as a result of the research that you do. But the best research takes time in the planning. And you may find when you distill things out in this PICO approach that actually that guides you as to what sort of methodology you might want. So you may be what you may be somebody who has lots of great ideas. What's helpful is to write those down and then sit on them for 24 hours or 48 hours, talk to other people, talk to your team, talk to colleagues and just refine and refine and refine because then your final project will be streamlined and coordinated. A spice, for example, would be what are the enablers for and barriers to engaging patients in communication during transitions of care? to, in and from acute care settings? And what are the strategies, tools and resources that enable patient engagement in communication during transition of care? This is a cracking paper. I put the reference in. I really encourage you to read it, especially those of you who, who, who wrote in the chat a little bit before that you're interested in communication and in these transitions of care. What do they mean? How can we achieve them more smoothly for our patients? What does it mean to a patient and a relative to be moved from home to hospital or hospital to home or within a hospital? So I've put the reference in there, do, do, do search it out. So for this, the setting is the transitions of care, the populations, adult, children, patients, families and health professionals. So this is a big study. I think you can see this is a big study. They're asking a lot of different people questions. And the rest of the slides is as it says, the I, the C, the E, E evaluation of peer review studies, etc. So there are some neat examples out there to help guide you, but it's time invested in designing your, me your, your, your methodology, choosing the right tool for the job is invaluable. And, and it, it stops you from giving a lot of time and thought and energy and effort into a project that actually might not yield any meaningful results at all. And that's nearly bordering on the unethical, particularly if you've involved patients and families or your colleagues in questionnaires or interviews or studies. If it's not going to go anywhere, then the time that they've spent 
to giving their time to your study, they actually could be with patients or receiving different palliative care. So it, it is really important. Very quickly, I said we weren't going to do much on systematic reviews. Where did they fit in? They came about with the move towards evidence-based medicine. And they were developed in response to the understanding that decision making in clinical practice isn't always based on the findings of research. Think about a lot of the medication that we used for palliative care before the research findings came along. It wasn't necessarily hugely evidence based. But as we are getting more trials and more research, there are more guidelines out there and people are bringing those together, but in a very systematic way. Systematic reviews are very exciting research design. It's not the easiest. Nothing is easy, but it's a particularly useful research design if you have not perhaps got the time or the resources to send questionnaires out to do some of these other methodologies we're going to talk about. It's very much down to you and your co-researchers collecting the papers, reading the papers, talking together. So for some people, it's their preferred way because that's how their brain works. They prefer to be analysing and synthesising a lot of other people's work. Um, but it is particularly structured, it's systematic, and it's not a shortcut. Every research methodology takes time and takes a lot of attention to detail. So what about these quantitative approaches then? Think, and, the, and in those seven examples, the things that tended towards quantitative were things like the efficacy of the new neuro, neuropathic pain agent or comparing two novel agents for nausea and vomiting. So quantitative approaches, I think quantitative quantity, that's how I remember it. They measure something, cause and effect, efficacy, effectiveness, incidence. They can be observational where you're counting things that are happening, case reports, prevalence surveys, case controls, cohort studies, where you collect people with a particular condition at a particular stage and you measure something. Incidents of pain, people admitted to a hospital with cancer, how many of those will, will describe pain? Think about the Robert Twycross study in St Christopher's in the late uh, early 70s, where he discovered that the patients being admitted to St Christopher's Hospice with cancer, 60% had more than three pains. So our follow-up question became at that point, not that I was in palliative care at that time, where else do you have pain? So there's observational quantitative approaches and there's experimental quantitative approaches where you either randomise or you don't randomise. And they sit fairly high up on that hierarchy of evidence. So there will be some bits of palliative care that a quantitative approach on its own will really yield you, give you new information that your colleagues, your clinical colleagues will welcome because it will guide us as to which analgesic to use. It will guide us. Our, pharma our pharmaceutical companies will say, please prescribe this antiemetic, please prescribe this one, don't do that, please prescribe this. We need the studies to tell us which is the most, um, the most effective. In contrast, the qualitative approach, which doesn't feature on the traditional hierarchy of evidence, explores something. Think about our palliative care topics that aren't related to symptom control. So think about the domains of total pain, the, the psychological, the social, the spiritual, the response to the financial pressures that people are under. Particularly think about spirituality, think about the role of religion for people towards the end of life, think about the role of spiritual things towards the end of life. Think about people's fears and feelings. Exploring those, you need to talk, you need to talk to people, you need to hear people's views. So actually you need to listen more than talk. My favourite, listen and silent, have the same letters. You can't listen unless you're silent. So do you do a field study where you observe what's going on? Classic, classic outpatient work. Somebody sits in outpatient and observes interactions of clinic staff with patients, families, porters, cleaners, um, receptionists. 
very, very, very time intensive, but gives you an enormous amount of information on on all sorts of levels of how that clinic will work. Do you interview people? Do you do a focus group where you bring people together and ask people to talk about a topic? And the thing about a focus group is that it's not about having lots of different views and asking people the same questions like in interviews. What you want is that conversation between a group of people which you record and you listen because somebody might hear somebody say something, um, a carer say something, say, yes, I agree with that. When I was looking after my father, things were difficult. And that was because, and then somebody else will say, oh, no, I didn't find that, but I found this. So a focus group is a very exciting methodology. It's quite tricky to analyse in that you need to listen very closely and work out which voice is which. But the depth of data that you collect will give you real understanding of some of these very difficult issues for palliative care. Um, and so you can do numbers, you can explore. There are some things that would be useful to have both those methodologies. So, for example, if you're thinking about the impact of that non-pharmacological measure for breathlessness, you might want numbers because you might want to know when you introduce the measure, whether it's a particular breathing technique or a handheld fan um, or a particular cognitive behavioural thing around breathlessness. You may want to measure the impact on breathlessness because you hope that your breathlessness scale will reduce in severity as a result of your intervention. But you might also want to do some interviews as to whether it's acceptable. Actually, what does it mean for the patient and for the family? So they add, if you mix the two together, sorry, I'm going to, I'm going to rephrase that. If you conduct both sorts of methodology in one research project, you add a huge depth of understanding to this topic area. Very often in large, large scale projects, you might find that actually you'll have three or four different groups working on a different sort of methodology, a different small question, all relating to that bigger question. You can do them both at the same time. You can do one and then another. So a classic fairly um straightforward mixed methodology would be to send a questionnaire out to people first asking people there to rank various aspects i don't know of their care or of the importance about spirituality in a curriculum to them and then you ask whether anybody will be willing to have interviews as well so you can have them going at the same time or you can do one followed by the other, so a survey followed by a focus group or an interview. But it's not a shortcut. So the challenge with doing mixed method research is that each methodology has to be as robustly and rigorously conducted as the other. So the simpler projects have much more likelihood of success and of finding out those new things, but you have to be very organised and you have to make sure that it's the attention to detail remains the same. So for all the methodologies, quantitative, qualitative or mixed, you need clarity, you need transparency. Have you described your methodology and your reasoning behind it as well enough that somebody could pick up that methodology and reproduce it and reproduce your study. And that's what, when you're reading the, when you're reading the literature to find out the background to your particular topic of interest, that's what you need to do. You need to read those methodologies and say, hang on, they haven't described what they've done about the people who didn't answer the questionnaire. How do we know that the questionnaire got to the people it needed to get to? So if there are gaps, interrogate that paper minutely. And it may be that because of the word count for the journal, they weren't able to describe their methodology in as much detail as you as a budding researcher might want. In that case, email the author. Authors love getting emails about their paper and ask for clarity. You're not, you're not, um, you're not criticising it. You're not saying, look, this is rubbish. I can't, I, I don't understand your methodology. You're not saying that at all. You're just saying, 
Thank you. I've read your paper with great interest. I'm a little unclear. Could you explain one, two, three, four, five? If people are coming to the conference, particularly in, in February, if people are coming and they are an author of some papers that <clears throat> you need more information on, speak to them at the end of their, at the end of their presentations. So check when you're reading methodology, check that it is clear, check it's transparent. Just very quickly, I've put these um, links in for this particular talk, which didn't come into the summer version. There are two really useful websites. So the CASP, the Critical Appraisal Skills Programme, has got a number of checklists. So if you're feeling a little bit intimidated by reading papers with a critical eye for their methodology and their detail, these are really useful um, resources and the Joanna Briggs Institute from Australia. So lots of critical appraisal tools. So I really would would recommend you if you're new to this or, or, or feel that you're not quite sure how effectively you critically appraise, use some of these tools. That's what they're there for. So next bit of chat, 20 minutes ish to go. Um, what about the challenges? So we've talked a little bit about the broad framework of when you might use quantitative, when you might use qualitative and when you might mix those two things together. I'm not going to say mix them up, mix them together to do your research. But what about the challenges in conducting research in palliative care? This is really, this is really important. And some of them seem obvious, but it's worthwhile, it's worthwhile saying. Again, because if people are writing their papers about their research and they're not talking about some of their limitations or some of the challenges, then one needs to just possibly question why. Yes, recruiting people, absolutely lack of hands and time. Yes, it may well depend on the, the size of your topic, mightn't it? You may have got a big idea for a topic, but actually it, it's not, you, you can't do it effectively at that moment. Getting approval, yes, ethics approval. Yes, Dendral, randomization. You can't, it's not ethical to randomize palliative care patients to a worse level of care than they would get with general care. So it's general care, or something amazing, but you can't it, it you 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 can't have people having a less good uh, well of care attrition and follow up. Yes, ethical clearance. Yes, the lack of awareness. Ethical meetings. Analyzing. Yes, yes, and hard if people are are sick and emotionally vulnerable. It's interesting that one, you know, because. Studies conducted in the UK, so there's my bit of critical appraisal, actually showed that patients valued being part of research because they felt that they were giving something back. And so we need to, it's a really good area to do some qualitative research in actually, and particularly in the Indian setting, perhaps just the, 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 the views of families and whether families may gatekeep their precious relatives could because they might because we care we care and we don't want to cause distress but it's interesting because actually well conducted research in the UK has reassured it that it's not wrong to ask but we need to respect it if people say no but yes the trouble is that actually people may not survive if you're doing a quantitative design and a longitudinal perspective study. <clears throat> perspective is better than retrospective because perspective will measure things as you go along. People may have died before the next collection point. Um, statistics, yes. Yes, tricky statistics. My, my, my take on statistics is if maths is not your forte, but you really want to do some quantitative work, just spend time getting to know colleagues who might be able to help and form your team. Research is a team skill. Research is terribly lonely doing it on your own and actually unlikely to be completely successful. The best, most effective research has built a team, almost created a team around itself. 
Um, so, so if you're if you are early in your research careers and quantitative feels as if the areas that you might want to research lend themselves more to quantitative methodologies, because don't forget you have to have the right tool for the job. Start to make that start to make those connections now. It may take you six months, may take you longer to find people who may be able to help. So just start. You never know with connections. Something my mother always said, you just you never know. They, they you can create that network around you, which at some point in your career will be incredibly helpful. Um, and and sharing. Yes. So moving on. Challenges. Thank you. So, yes, there are challenges conducting research in part of care. Of course, there are. Um, but they're not beyond thinking about. And I think the think about the role of the ethics committee. If you have to seek ethical approval for your research, which generally one should until being told not that, that you don't need it. But the role of the ethics committee is, is a gatekeeper. It's a parent. And if it's your relative who's being asked questions in research or giving a novel agent for neuropathic pain or nausea and vomiting, I think you would want them to be looked after and safeguarded and not vulnerable. So although um, ethics committees have a reputation for um, stalling research and for asking more questions, and it's a big hurdle to get through, from the point of view of patient care, and think of the patients that we look after at the end of their lives or with a life limiting illness. The ethics committees are there to protect them. And so it's up to us to design our question and our appropriate methodology for that question, get the right tool for the job. That's our first step. And our next step is to be able to communicate that with how we write it, with how we say it, if we are invited along to that ethics panel. So again, if you're new to research, if you want to conduct studies, top tip is to find out who your ethics panel is. Do they have observer roles? Can you go and listen out? But put together your ethics application, thinking of all the questions that might ask. Have you thought about dropout? Have you thought about distress? If you're interviewing people, what are you going to do? If that patient or that relative or that colleague becomes distressed, have you put a distress protocol in your study protocol? So it's that attention to detail. Often the best research ideas come on the back of an envelope. You're, you're sitting having coffee one day or you've finished a ward round or finished a clinic and suddenly thought, ah, we don't know what happens when we move somebody from the hospice to home on a Saturday when the family is not there or we don't know. There's something new coming out of, I don't know, Boston about neuropathic pain. We don't know if it works. But once you've had that idea of, right, this is what I want to look at, then starts the work. But it's, it's, all, it's all for the benefit of patients. So at the end of all of this, have that patient there at, at, at the end of the tunnel. That's that person. Generations of patients after the ones you're looking after now will benefit from this research. Even if the research finds that there aren't the connections that you thought you were, you've just done an enormously useful piece of work that prevents other people from spending time, resources, money researching the same thing. So publishing your research is another ethical uh, as ethical obligation, I would suggest. I'll come back to that in a minute. So what are the challenges? Think them through in terms of the study population. Are there particular issues around any of those study populations that you might need to really think through? Healthcare professionals are exhausted, overworked, over busy. Coronavirus hasn't gone away. So they're quite tricky study samples at the moment, but actually, depending on what your question is, they may be really keen to help. Is the design a challenge? Is the design the best design for the job? Does it require you to have skills yourself? Do you need to get and other members of a team involved? And that's around team working and leadership, which is so interesting. Um, what about resources? Is it going to cost a lot of money? to do research? Are there ways to minimise that cost of money? And again, from COVID times, there are quite a lot now of free to use open access materials. And then, of course, there's the bigger picture, isn't it? There's the organisational and context with legal issues if you're doing things around legislation at the end of life um, or things which may 
tr may trespass into into legal into legal areas but can you find somebody to advise you is there something around the particular culture of that population that you want to study have you got support? Where is your support coming from? Is it from colleagues? Are you doing your research as part of a higher degree? Are you doing it because you want to set up research in your organisation, your setting? That's fantastic. Every clinical place ideally has some kind of research link to it, but we've not got the resources to have full-blown research departments in every clinical place, have we? So who can you network with? Who can you team up with? How can you make the rest of your team research aware and aware of the need for research? Clinicians need researchers, researchers need clinicians. So there are challenges, yes, but thinking them through, they often can be overcome. So let's just think now a little bit around, around some of these things. We've talked about some of these things as we've gone, as we've gone through. We've got about just about 10 eight minutes left if we want time for questions. So the efficacy of a new analgesic for neuropathic pain. A lot of you, it, this was one of the, this was definitely one of the more quantitative approaches, wasn't it? Because you need to think about your pain scores. We've got a new analgesic for neuropathic pain that perhaps might work in a particular way. Does it make a difference? I think you need numbers for that. And you might need a clever quality of life score for that if you want to actually look at quality of life as well as does it reduce pain scores. Quite complicated, possibly, in the sense of defining neuropathic pain, but you could decide that you want to do it in neuropathic pain in a particular cohort of patients. Patients with a spinal cord compression, patients with a cancer patients with diabetic neuropathic pain, although that's possibly steering a little bit away from palliative care unless you have them in the end stages of diabetes when neuropathic pain can be quite tricky. So that was that was definitely more of a more of a um a quantitative one. You could put qualitative in there, but uh, to add, but I think so there could be a mix, but I think possibly the the first areas of research, if you wanted to prioritize, then it would probably be quantitative. If you've got questions as we go through these or additional thoughts, then please don't hesitate to add them into the chat. But in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to the next one, I think, I hope. In a minute, there we are. Views in your organisation about the impact of new legislation around end of life care. So that the, what I was thinking for this one the, the word for me about that is the views. So this one tended to be more qualitative. I think if I can recall, some people weren't quite sure. You could, I suppose, do quantitative in terms of rating people's views. Do they think they're important, important, want to change, not very important, don't really want to change. But the views, you want to know what your colleagues are thinking and probably if there is new legislation around end of life care, you're gonna to have to persuade your organization possibly to change some of its habits. You may need to do quality improvement work, but to do that, you need to generate this new knowledge. You need to know what your colleagues are thinking. So for me, I would probably head towards a qualitative approach. Whether you do that by survey, with lots of big text boxes that people can add their thoughts, whether you do it by interviews, focus groups, you get a lot of rich data if you were asking people to talk about these things in front of you. But whether you'd physically get people to talk is interesting, whether people would, would prefer a more anonymized approach with a survey approach, but you need to make sure that if it was a survey, you need survey, you need views. So it's not the short closed questions, you need views, you need people to be able to write sentences and then you're going to analyze those for themes coming through those sentences. So if this doesn't sound a little bit too confusing, I think a qualitative approach, but you might find that using a questionnaire, a much more anonymized view, you might get more data if you could get the responses. So that's that, 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 that was thinking about that one. 
the impact on patients of a new non-pharmacological approach for breathlessness. So the impact on patients was the, was the key phrase for me on that one. So again, I think this might well be mixed. I think you'd want quantitative, you'd want to know, wouldn't you, that your new non-pharmacological approach made a breathlessness score better. So in an ideal world, you'd use perhaps one of the validated breathlessness scores rather than rather than invent your own. Um, or you might have to do a feasibility study taking a validated breathlessness score and putting it in, translating it into your setting, your language, potentially. Um, but I think I think you'd need that. But also impact on patients. Might you want to explore that patient's views, patients and families' views? Was this acceptable to them? to have this new approach? Was it difficult? So again, a more qualitative additional approach for this question, I think would be helpful. The view of bereaved relatives on the impact of PPE on communication skills. Again, the views, I think this is probably, probably qualitative, tricky if they're bereaved relatives and the challenge for this one would be when you would ask them. You need to ask them soonish after the event, but is that too soon? And again, would a survey be better than a um, than than interviews and talking and listening? Cosmic question. There's not necessarily the perfect answer to this because it might decide you might need to think actually exactly what views or exactly what exact what bit of impact on PPE. Um, and a very good question here coming in. Thank you. Thank you, Stanley. Why not always do robust mixed method for any research? I think it, it depends on the question. I think it depends on the question. You might find that you've got a topic area where actually there might be two slightly different questions, like the impact of new non-pharmacological approaches for breathlessness. But I think mixed methods can be very muddly. And I think it is it's probably more streamlined for new researchers to tr to be very clear if you're going to do mixed methods, you need to be very clear why and what does each method give you distinctly that the other one doesn't. And so for big topic areas, then, yes, you're right, you probably do need mixed methods, but for the smaller um, very specific area of, areas of research. I think it's good to, we've got greater clarity and for the purposes of our colleagues doing systematic reviews to try to keep to one method for some of these areas of research is probably more is probably more sensible. But on the bigger picture, I think I think you're right. Novel agents for nausea and vomiting, that was fairly straightforward. I think that is that is prob that's more likely to be quantitative. Spiritual care, again, views of healthcare professionals. You could do some clever work with a little bit of numbers, rating people's importance, but actually you want to know what people think. But this is a little bit vague as an area, isn't it? Is it on the role of spiritual care education? Might it be where it's placed? Might it be who best to deliver it? So that's actually, that, need, that needs a little bit of work, this area of research. That's not quite specific enough for me. And then finally, barriers to patients achieving their preferred place of care. This is quite interesting. This could be mixed methods research, definitely, if you want to collect numbers of who achieves their preferred place of care. But you do need to know why. And we need to think about why the reasons from healthcare professionals, from patients, from families. So that's a lovely piece of work using mixed methods, using both numbers and and not numbers. The last couple of slides, because we're just we need to we need to finish, don't we? But I think to bring it all together, it's what's the right tool for the job. A hammer is not going to mend my earring, I hope. No methodology is easier than another. It depends on your question, and some methodologies may be more appropriate for your question. There may be practical issues, your particular project. You may have a time frame because it's part of an, an award um, or part of a degree, and that will limit what you can do. But that's fine. You limit what you can do, but you have a very you have a very specific um, study. Research governance is crucial, whatever 
the methodology. And that also includes sharing, presenting the work in a way that others can find it, even the negatives, even the research that doesn't show what you want it to show. It's really important to share it. Think of the patients, the families, your colleagues who have given time to that research. They, they, they need to know that their voice has been heard and it's meant something, even if it hasn't given you the results that you expected, but you're generating new information. So actually when you start, you probably, you shouldn't really know what the, what the outcome's going to be. And all research needs meticulous attention to detail and transparency. So how do you get started? Just be curious. Be curious. When you're with your patients, be curious. Think, read around it, critically appraise the papers, talk to colleagues, go to conferences, networks, and collaborate. And how can that research benefit the palliative care that your patients receive? So coming up to the end, we have, I hope, reviewed the different research paradigms, given you a bit of a flavour of, of where each of them fit and thought about their application to palliative care issues. I've probably got about 30 seconds for questions, apologies, but there may be, if there are any questions, I'm more than, more than happy to, uh, to answer them. But thank you very much. I, I hope it's been an exciting talk. I hope it's made you think. And I really look forward to hearing, reading, seeing some of this research coming out in the future. Uh, thank you, Fiona. Thank you very much. It was so good. And uh, I think everybody must have understood clearly and you are so clear and crisp on, on by giving examples, asking questions in between. And I think this was such a fantastic session and qualitative, quantitative and mixed method research, I think. Was a fantastic. Are there any? I can't see any questions, but Archana, if I missed anything, there are people have asked enough questions in between. <laughs> Nothing at the moment, ma'am. Nothing at the moment. So, uh, thank you, Fiona. Thank you once again for giving your time. I know that uh, you are a very busy person, but uh, you have given your time. Uh, somebody you. has asked, Do we need ethics clearance for research on? Uh, healthcare professionals. This is what Veronique you want to ask. Can you open your mic and ask? <laughs> Veronique? Hi, we, we want to hear you, Veronique, your voice. Can you speak? Yes, sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. Okay. Uh, now ask. Yeah, you, you got the question all right. When we are working on our team, for example, a palliative care team, doing some um, qualitative research, do we need, need to go through a head, uh, ethical clearance? I think it may depend on your organisation where you work. Uh, in Cardiff, for the Cardiff course, we, if people are going to do work on their, asking their colleagues for their views, they don't go through um, the National Health Service Research Council ethics approval. They go through a school of medicine ethics approval. So it may depend where you work. And I think my suggestion would probably be to ask, to find out. I think if we try and do research without seeking ethical clearance, because it's easier to do it without seeking ethical clearance, and you're doing research to try not to need to do ethical clearance if you see what I mean which is which is very tempting I completely understand that but the problem with that is that um, actually are you safeguarding your population that you are asking the questions of now in the UK qualitative research up until about 20 years ago generally was not didn't go through ethics. So I, for my piece of qualitative research around daycare um, and what, what palliative care daycare should provide, I sought ethical approval. So I filled all the forms in and we were interviewing patients, relatives and staff. Um, and in, those, in that day, they said we didn't need it. Now you do need it. And it's it does two things. It safeguards the participants. Actually, it safeguards us as researchers because it means that an independent panel has looked at your design, your protocol, and thinks that it is, um, and in a sense has given it the rubber stamp, has, given, has, said, has said, yes, it's okay. But I am aware there may be different areas around India where they, that people may have 
people may have different views on that. So I think probably, I, I don't know, colleagues, um, uh, Professor Shushma, whether there's anything else you'd want to add to that. I think that's how I'd answer that from my uh, so, UK perspective. So uh, for the, uh, I think this is same in AIMS, if somebody wants to do uh, such kind of research with healthcare professional, I think we have to take an AIMS ethics committee clearance, but definitely we will not need required Indian Council of Medical Research Trial Registration for this. So this is same here. There is one more question, to, uh, Piona. I think we are, uh, people are, are now. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Tarun. Uh, Tarun, do you want to ask yourself or I should read it? So he's uh, asking. Can you yeah, can, yeah can we you? can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, okay, thank you for organizing this lovely presentation. I'm very happy to be a part of this. Just allow me to ask if we, as if I'm a physiotherapist by profession, if we want to conduct uh, a study on assessing the impact of working in the palliative care, and maybe for a you know, period of one year, two year, or more than two, two to ten, uh, categorizing into different uh, mode, like stratifying the sample. What do you suggest uh, is the best mode uh, will be for uh, finding and assessing the impact of that? Because quite a number of us, like when even we go, I go, I feel like uh, sometimes very uncomfortable when I come up. Uh, uh, like we cannot help even though we know that this, this is an area so how you suggest what you suggest what is the best mode to find out the impact on those people qualitative think, or uh, yeah i think this is a really important area actually and i think we we need more of this research particularly over the next few years as where rebuilding services as a result of the pandemic and understanding more about palliative care and getting palliative care out into different disciplines and different services so i think there might it i think it depends on your it depends on the size of the team and the potential size of the project but there are some validated tools around about um, the impact of palliative care on the, psych uh, the psychological burden of caregiving as a healthcare professional. So there are there are some tools mainly developed in the US, but I, having critically appraised some of them, they're, they're I think they'd be reasonably applicable to any setting by what they're asking. So you could do a mixed method by having numbers, a scale for the relative amount of impact but actually i think some qualitative work would be really important because you need to know the themes of what people are thinking is it the emotional burden is it the spiritual burden is it the physical burden depending on depending on what um air, what uh, discipline you are does it depend on whether people are looking after patients at the same age as them does it depend on whether people have experienced bereavement in the last six months does that make things more difficult etc and those i don't think you can capture by a scale i don't think i know of any particular scale um, or tool around that so i think for a really comprehensive view i think you could do two of those i you could do two approach i think i would probably Depending on the team, I might go for the quantitative, use that validated tool first. If you're researching in a team that's not used to research and also not used to perhaps sharing their feelings and 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 unburdening about the impact, it might be a bit threatening to go in with interviews or focus groups first. I think a focus group approach might be useful, providing there's not too much of a power difference between participants in, in a focus group. Um, but I think that would be a really valuable area of research and not simply for physiotherapy either. I think, I think that would be an area of research across many of the health disciplines at the moment. So good luck, good luck with that. And if you come to Bangalore in February, please, please, please come and find me and let me know how you're getting on. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for very beautiful. Like, I understood the perspective. I hope I can see and uh, see the wonderful people and other dignitaries, including you. Uh, just one thing. So you talked about focus groups. So you suggest to do a pilot study because the in case we are adopting a questionnaire with a prior approval, we need to do a pilot study because in different countries, some questions may be sensitive, cultural perspectives. So you focus 
uh, I mean, like you, we conduct a focus group study, and then we get. Uh, uh, I mean, understood that it should not be a big gap. So you think pilot study with the adopted questionnaire with modification of the questionnaire, which may be culturally inappropriate, or maybe uh, we have to modify those. I would look at the questionnaire first, be guided by the questionnaire, and. In an ideal world, you probably have a research, a, gather a few people around you and look at us, look at that. There, I think there are there are at least two or three different questionnaires. Look at them and decide them, decide whether you feel that you need to pilot them first, because you're absolutely right. There may be there may be questions that would be too culturally sensitive. But I think that's a that's something best not answered on your own. That's something best answered with a few people as a team around you. And in an absolutely ideal world, if you had got a paste, um, uh, if it's, I'm just thinking of its caregivers, yes, have somebody from the care team. If you were going to do in a completely separate thing, if you were going to do patients, having a lay representative as well can be helpful. But for that, for, for what you're talking about, I would probably collect the possible tools to use and then gather your team about you and see whether you can use them as they are or whether you might need to adapt them. And then if you're adapting them, your first step is actually then a feasibility study, but that can yield results, that can be written up, that can start the way for new areas of research, which may then bring in additional resources. So it's a first step, Def definitely worth doing. Mm. Thank you, Fiona, and thank you, Tarun. So uh, I think we had a very good discussion, but I can see two comments from senior palliative care physicians. So I would request them that Please keep your comment short and say something, Dr. Sukhdev and Dr. Stanley. Dr. Sukhdev, uh, you wanted to say something. It is not a question, but it's their comments. Dr. Sukhdev? Uh, or Dr. Actually, yes, Dr. Sukhdev, yes, please. Uh, actually, there are a lot of um, body-mind interventions which really affect the symptom control. Not much studies either in India or abroad has been taken up. I think this is another area where you can tell our young people so that like uh, this spiritual uh, manipulation, like uh, own chanting, many other uh, procedures are yes, there. Yes, yes. Yeah. And if you can add with the morphine, then you can prove that uh, it, uh, by adding those things, the dose of morphine or dose of other drugs comes down. That'll be really a brilliant thing. And But there's no uh, enough data. So I just uh, thinking. So we can we can plan this. We can think this. Some, Dr. Some Stanley? Multi yeah, sorry, study. go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Short yeah. comment, please. <laughs> yes. Anything. Thank you, Fiona, for that uh, very good summary and helpful summary. Um, uh, what, what I'm saying is that, the, as you said, clinicians need researchers and researchers need clinicians. So why not all the top researchers, you know, select a few things and do all the write down a, f a fantastic protocol addressing all these things and then give it to the clinicians in multiple centers. So you will get not only qualitative research, but also quantity, you know, good research coming from many centers, but thoroughly worked out you know, because the usual problem is, you know, you don't have the time or the enough people to do all this kind of detailed uh, qualitative work, uh, quality work. Yeah. So that's my kind. Of, thank you. I think that's a really good idea. What we'd call, I don't know what you'd call it, you'd call it a think tank, although that's a bit of an old term, but collaborative, yes. Collaborative, collaborative work. A collaborative. Yeah. Very good idea. I like that one. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Stanley. But in India, most of the time, problem is clinicians are researchers. There is no separate team of research <laughs> and clinicians. <so. laughs> anyway, so thank you very much, Fiona. Uh, there are so many comments. Uh, Archana, what I want to request you, please keep uh, or store all the comments and send it to Dr. Fiona. There are so many people, they, they like the lecture, they are informative, they're saying that it's an informative session, they have learned a lot. So thank you very much, Fiona, for giving your precious time. And we are very, very fortunate that you are here with us for this lecture. You, uh, you were there and uh, thank you very much once again. We'll keep bothering you Thank whenever. You. Please, Thanks please so. keep bothering me. Thank you very much. <laughs> I wish you all a very good evening.